Well, we want to uh, start our Bible class here to, today, and I'd like to say that, you know, we always seem to have prayer uh, requests that we need, and one of the things is that we need to pray for uh, the Lockheed family. Uh, I got a report today that Dorothy Lockheed may not make it through the day. So we need to pray for the family, uh, the family that's left, and ask them, ask God to cover them and to help Sister Dorothy Lockheed to ease on out uh, of this life and into the arms of our Savior. Then we also want to remember uh, several that uh, are in need. Uh, we need to continue to remember Sister Stell and her family and Sister uh, Barbara Sauer always has requests and Sister uh, Shirley Robinson. They're all families that are in need so Let's let's remember them here today, and uh, uh, let's let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, thanking you for your mercy, Lord, and for your love. Look down upon us, Lord, and watch over these, Lord, that are less fortunate, these that need your help, Lord. We ask that you touch our minds and our hearts today as we go over. Uh, some of your precious word of God. We ask these things in your name. Amen. I may say here, uh, I thought maybe we'd go over the book of James. And so, if you'll bear with me, we'll get started uh, on that right away. And of course, James was a hack brother of Jesus and and we want to continue to remember that. But let's uh, let's read here in uh, James 1 and 1. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So this is not only to the uh, the church in Jerusalem, but it's also to the tribes that are scattered abroad. And uh, let's continue on. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And he gives a reason for this. He said, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And uh, patience is something that all of us need. Uh, I know several occasions uh, were brought about uh, with the wanting patience. I know we had one sister that came down for prayer once, and she uh, was requesting uh, from the brethren to pray for that that uh, God would give her patience and so they started praying for her and said Lord send tribulations and troubles and send stuff her way Lord and she says no no wait wait I don't want that I want patience and so they began to pray again and Lord, send trouble and, and trials and different things to test her way, Lord. And she stopped him once again. Said, you don't understand. I'm asking for patience. And uh, the brethren told her, it says tribulation worketh patience. And so that's what we have to realize is that the things that we go through can help us uh, to obtain patience. And how does that happen? Well, when you're going through a trial, uh, it may seem like it's going on for 
ever. And you learn that, you know, time is relative. And and if you, you will try to uh, put that out of your mind and just continue to worship God and to thank God for the goodness and the things he's done, when it's all, when you've gone through that, you'll find that you it has worked some patience in your life. And so this is one of the things that we that we need to incorporate in our life. And just by the trials of life, uh, these things can come and help us obtain that. And one of the things that happens is that uh, through our tests and trials, we will find that God has always come to our rescue to help us. And uh, in doing that, that helps us realize that if we'll just wait on the Lord, uh, he'll be there. And there's a scripture there in Isaiah 40 that we can hook in with that. And uh, it says, uh, talks about uh, they shall wait. Uh, they shall rise up on wings at, like an eagle. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. And uh, th But it starts off at the very beginning of that verse. They that wait upon the Lord. And if you don't wait upon the Lord, then those blessings don't follow. Uh, let's read on here. It says, um, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. And uh, we know that if we ask God, we can receive wisdom. And wisdom comes uh, by seeking it, by searching for it, and by praying for it. And if we like wisdom, you know, God's able to, to help us and to supply that. Uh, and it says, for let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. But let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And uh, there's other scriptures that we can tie in with that. Uh, one, Jesus said, you can't serve two, two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. And... Uh, uh, so many times when we're, we haven't sold out or we haven't become completely uh, sold on what we're doing, then our mind is in trouble. It's troubled and we're, we can be in torment even with some of these things because we have not made a clear cut decision. And uh, so a double-minded man is unstable because he wavers from one point to the other, and just as it says, as the waves of the sea. And so uh, let's, let's work on that. The ninth verse. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. And that's one of the things that God said he would do. Uh, he said he would, he would raise those that are abased up, and he would bring down those that are exalted. And uh, God wants us to be even killed. He doesn't want a person that is way up here uh, exalted uh, with a head that won't fit through a double door. And he doesn't want us to be so low that we don't have any confidence in ourself at all. And so uh, that's why James is making this statement. In the 10th verse, he says, but the rich in that he is 
that he is made low because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. So James covers both of those. Uh, the 11th verse, for the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass and the flower thereof and the uh, thereof falleth and the grace of the fashion of it perishes it away. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. And so, you know, you, this is sort of a little bit of a paradox, you know. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit for they, uh, uh, and w when we think about that poor in spirit, uh, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, we think about that, uh, but at the same time, it's talking about being poor in our own spirit. But we need to be rich in God's spirit. In the same way with this, uh, when we consider ourselves, we shouldn't be exalted. We shouldn't be so high and lifted up. And what is the saying? Uh, uh, so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good. And so these are just things that we need to remember and consider when we do these things. Uh, then uh, let's read on here. Uh, in the 12th verse, he says, Blessed is a man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. And in the 13th verse, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So James clearly lets us know that uh, there will be temptations that we'll, we'll face. But all of our temptations usually come from our, our own self, you know, uh, our own lust, our own wants and desires. Uh, these are things. Uh, that's part of the carnal nature of man, and uh, so we're drawn away by those things. And uh, God doesn't tempt us to do wrong. You know, this is not anything at all. And some people ask about uh, uh, with Abraham, wasn't he tempted to uh, to uh, sacrifice? Uh, Isaac, his only son, and uh, probably a better rendering of looking at that is he was tried, and uh, but you know that God would not allow him to offer up his son, but God was using that as a picture, and so God doesn't tempt us. Uh, we're tempted when we're drawn away by our own lust just as, as James says here. And so, and he goes on to say, as I've already read, when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And so when, when we are tempted and uh, by our carnal nature to do something that's wrong, then it produces sin when we obey that, that, that lust, that desire, that want, and then sin, if it's not taken care of, uh, if it's not recompensed or uh, if it's not forgiven, it bringeth forth death. And so it's very important that we understand that. Let's go on here in the book of James. It says in the 16th verse, do not err, my beloved brethren. 
every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variable, neither shadow of turning. Now let me talk on that just a little bit. Uh, because it says, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variable in it, this, neither shadow of turning. Uh, when you walk out on a bright day, uh, you're going to see a shadow, aren't you? And uh, even if the sun is directly overhead and you're standing straight up, there's still a shadow. But it would be under your feet if you could be elevated uh, off the ground. You would see your shadow underneath you. And uh, this is what it means by the shadow of turning, or that's the way I use it. And there's a, uh, you got to go back to the tabernacle in the wilderness to really understand this. And uh, when you, went into the tabernacle of the wilderness of course you went in through the the one opening that was there the the one gate the one door and who is that one gate one door of course the picture of that is jesus uh, there's no other name under heaven whereby a man can be saved but by and through the name of jesus christ and so to get in through there uh, into the outer courts, you've got to come through Jesus. Uh, but as you continue on, you know, there's a brazen altar and there's a, the, uh, uh, the labor of, uh, with women's looking glass in it. And these are all pictures that I won't go into now. But when you go into the holy place, uh, you'll find after you get through those curtains, you'll find inside there uh, a candlestick uh, with seven candles or seven lights on it. You'll find a table of showbread and you'll find an uh, altar of incense. And that's all in there, but there's no light coming from the outside. But the light is provided by that seven, uh, seven golden uh, candlestick there that's in, in the Holy of Holies, Holy holy Place, I'm sorry. And, but if you go into the next compartment, there is no light from the outside that comes in there. But there is the Shekinah glory of God. And what I mean by that, it's a glory that has no shadow because light comes from everywhere so there's no shadow produced at all and that's a, that's how i use this illustration that james is talking about uh, because in god there is no shadow of turning the 18th verse and of his own uh well let me go back and read that 17th verse again so we connect it all together Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Let me pause right there for a moment. Every man to be swift to hear. You know, so many of us uh, have a hard time listening, hearing others, hearing what others have to say. We have a difficult time with that sometimes, and we we want to interject our own thoughts and our own things. And uh, I've seen people that, that that just couldn't, they was trying
trying their best to, to, to give their portion and to really jump in there. And sometimes people are so talkative that they, they find uh, that they're, they're talking all the time and someone else is trying to interject something, but they can't get a word in edgewise. And James is telling us, uh, let us be swift to hear. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a good thing to listen uh, because if you'll listen, you can learn some things. Uh, Brother Souders used to have a poem that he quoted, and he talked about the wise old owl. He said, uh, the, that wise old owl, uh, the more he heard, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he knew. And said, don't you wish we could be like that old wise old owl? Well, there is some, some truth in that, isn't it? Uh, and he goes on to say, be slow to speak. Have you ever said anything that uh, you regret it afterwards? There's plenty of sayings and, and things like that that we can uh, interject here. You know, uh, one of them is uh, to put your brain into gear before you put your mouth into action. And... Uh, there's many different uh, uh, bits of information like that that we can use. Uh, but he says, slow to speak. Uh, so we should weigh our words, shouldn't we? Because words that are spoken harshly sometimes cost us so much. And sometimes we got to eat crow, as they say. Uh, but we're supposed to be uh, slow to speak, and he says, slow to wrath. You know, many times we may uh, we may want to find out and go. Excuse me, just a moment. Uh, That's my phone. Um, let me uh, uh, go back to where I was. Uh, slow to wrath. Many times we'll, we're quick tempered and we're, we'll jump at something that will make us, uh, someone may speak something to us or say something to us and, and we're Quick tempered. And uh, if you are like that, that's something that you definitely need to work on because being slow to wrath, uh, because you'll say things that you wish you had not have said. And uh, there was one thing, uh, a saying that I used to use quite often, and uh, some of the brethren talked to me afterwards and they gave me some more information to put with that. And it says there's two things that come back, come not back. And one of them is the spoken word, and the other is a sped arrow. And uh, in other words, after you shoot an arrow, you can't pull it back. And neither, after you've spoken a word, can you take it back. It's already out there. And uh, the, what the brethren have added to me, is uh, you can also include there uh, a text or an email. Once it's sent, you can't get it back. So in this day and age, we've got other ways that we can make trouble for ourselves. All right, let's uh, uh, read on about wrath here. Uh, it says, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, superfluity of naughtiness, 
and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And so we do know that that wrath, uh, the wrath of man is not the righteousness of God. We, I think we're all aware of that. And as it says, lay apart the filthiness and uh, superfluity of naughtiness. And that goes with uh, being too swift to speak. Uh, and that 22nd verse, but be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man beholding himself in, uh, beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth away, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. And uh, I think we can we can all understand that uh, that if you're just a hearer of the word, and you don't incorporate it in your life, you don't become a doer, uh, then you are someone that has read or or seen what the word of God says, but you you don't uh, pick up on it and put it into your life. You just hear it only. And it's like the man looking in the glass. And uh, then here in the 25th verse, it says, But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, nor uh, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deeds. And it talks about looking into the perfect law of liberty. And that's what he's referring to is our word of God, our Bible. And we can look into that perfect uh, law of liberty and it can unveil our faults. It can show us what we have wrong and how to correct that. And so uh, we're, we're grateful that the Word of God is there, but let's be not just a hearer or just a reader, but a doer of it. Let's put it and incorporate it into our life. And one other illustration I'd like to use is, uh, you know, we look into this perfect law of liberty and we're supposed to be looking at ourselves, supposed to be looking right back at ourselves. But too many times we'll take and we'll turn this word of God, this mirror, and we'll look at our brother over here and start analyzing and criticizing and finding his faults. That's not what it's for. It's to correct ourselves. We need to have it looking at our life and working on ourselves. And if he will do the same, then things will work well. And uh, let's let's read on the 26th verse. Now he gets into some deep uh, truths and. Uh, you might say, no, he's meddling. No, he's he's working, he's working on us. And if any man among you seem to be religious and broadeth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. A pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows and their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. This is what we're referring to. Is he's talking about a man bridling his tongue, and if he can't bridle his tongue, then he deceives himself, uh, and his religion is vain because your mouth can get you into all kind of trouble. 
And so uh, he laid the groundwork, and he's, he's working on this. He's talking about being slow to speak and about controlling our tongue, and we're going to go into this and deeper as we go through this book of James. So uh, we're getting ready to go into chapter 2. Okay, let us go on into chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. And it says, Brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of person? For if, if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth gay clothing, and say unto him, Set thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand that thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not partial in yourselves, and have become judges of evil thoughts? And so uh, James is, is letting us know some of the uh, nature that that the carnal man has and and yes we our nature wants to favor people that that look look nice you know they look like they've got money you know and why would we do that because maybe they can do something good for us but if a poor man comes in uh, we can have the attitude if we're not careful of looking at them and saying, well, no use in trying to to lift them up because, you know, they're just poor and they, they can't help us with anything. Well, that's the wrong attitude, and that's what uh, James is showing us. In the fifth verse, he says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor? of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him. But you have despised the poor. Do, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seat? Do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? And uh, this is one of the things, usually the rich are arrogant uh, or can be very arrogant and uh, because they've got more than other people so they think that they may be better than other people uh, but thank God there are a few people that that God is blessed with wealth and that they are mindful of their fellow man and they're not uh, arrogant and, and they just realize that but, but for the grace of God, they could be just like their neighbor. And uh, so, uh, and this is one of the things that Jesus said. He said, the poor receive the gospel gladly. And, and that's usually the case. And why is that? That the poor would receive the gospel gladly, but the rich would turn away from it. Well, it's because the rich may not have needs in their life. Uh, they, they may have all the money they need, and they may have this or that, and, and so they find no need of anything, and therefore uh, they don't receive the gospel gladly because they don't feel like it could do them any good. But how mistaken they are. Because it's only through the word of God and through the gospel of Jesus Christ that we can receive eternal life. And there's many a rich man that would give all that he had just for uh, more time, more, uh, just a few more hours in his life. Uh, we give all that he had, but uh, you can't buy it, can you? You can't buy it that way. But it has to be, uh, you receive it of Jesus Christ, 
And uh, he goes on to say here, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, uh, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. And that's the way the Lord would have us look at things, uh, to love our neighbor as ourself. In fact, Jesus was one asked, uh, what were the two great commandments? And he said, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he said, the second is likened to the first, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so uh, on these two hang all the weight of the law and the prophets, uh, Paul said. So uh, let's read on here. Uh, the, the 10th verse. No, ninth verse is where we left off. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin. Did you hear that? If ye have respect of persons, you commit sin and are convinc convic convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that saith, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. And so the point it being is that if we break any of the law, we're transgressors. If, if we, uh, you know, trespass and, and go beyond what the law of God commands us, uh, then we are sinners. And we know sin bringeth forth death. In the 12th verse, uh, so speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Wow. Let's read that again. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. You know, that's, that's pretty deep, isn't it? Uh, to realize that God puts it on a scale. If we don't show mercy, then we don't get mercy. And that's one of the great things. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And so if you want mercy in your life, then you've got to be merciful to others. And if you're not, then you're going to get the same thing coming back to you that you dish out. There's another scripture that talks about uh, um, he that... Uh, uh, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Uh, and if so if we sow an unmerciful attitude, that's what we get back from God, is an unmerciful attitude. But if we're ready to forgive and show plenty of mercy, well, then that's what God's going to give back to us. Uh, let's read on here. It says, what do, do it profit, my brethren, that a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? So this is a question he's asking. Can faith save him if he doesn't have works? And he goes on to say, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, 
notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what good it profit? In other words, by faith, you receive something from God. You receive salvation from God. Uh, but we're supposed to work out our own salvation with fear and with trembling. And if we uh, just come in and, and we think we've got it made now that Jesus forgave us and he's ushered us into the kingdom, well, there's something that we're still to do if we're going to gain uh, what that original faith brought us into, you know, uh, and that is the chance of eternal life. But it takes some works on our part to obtain it. Uh, and Jesus made this statement. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so uh, when you when you find Jesus Christ by faith, yes, there's a love you have for him. But you show how much love you have by how much you obey his commandments. All right, let's. Let's read on. Even so, faith, if it have not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man can say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So what's he saying? Well, if Jesus told us what to do, and he did, he told us what to do, how to live, and uh, by accepting his faith, or accepting by faith the things that Jesus said, then we're to follow what he laid out for us. And uh, if we don't, then then our faith is void, really, because we haven't encapsulated or taken on the whole thing. And Jesus made this statement in Matthew 11, I believe it's 29, 28 or 29, and it says, uh, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. But you've got to learn of him. You've got to take his yoke upon you. And if you'll do that, then you will find rest. You'll find rest from the carnal nature. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, let's read on. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But do they have salvation? Do they have eternal life? No. So just that belief is what James is showing. Does not guarantee eternal life. 20th verse, but will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered his Isaac, his son, upon the altar? And that's what he's, he's showing here. Uh, he, Abraham, he was justified by works, just not by faith. You know, it says Abraham uh, believed and he had faith, but uh, by actually taking his son and getting ready to offer him up, he done it by works. And this is what, what James is showing us here. And the 22nd verse, seeth thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect. 
And so that's how his faith was perfected, by showing the works or obeying God in what he was going to do. And uh, 23rd verse, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Why? Not just because he believed in God, but he believed in God enough to obey what God's instructions were to him. That's the point. By not just believing in God. You know, even before I, I came to the Lord, I believed in God. But that didn't avail me anything. Uh, but I had to find him and began to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. And uh, so, so let's read that again. Uh, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friends of God, friend of God. And he believed God enough, as I said, uh, to obey what God's instructions were to him. Do we believe God enough to obey his instructions to us? Because it's by that that we can reach and gain eternal life. And then the 24th verse. You see then how by works a man is justified, not by faith only, not by faith only. Likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Faith without works is dead also. And uh, that's why we've got to rightly divide the word of God. Because if we don't rightly divide it, we'll get the, the uh, idea in our heads and our minds that all it takes is just accepting Jesus and then we've got it made. But no, there's more to be done. There's more to be done, and that's to follow the Word of God and to follow His instruction. And we can, we can show that by going to Matthew 7, the last part of that chapter. And Jesus made the statement, He that heareth my words, remember this is what James says, uh, be not only a hearer but a doer. But Jesus said, he that heareth my words and doeth them not, he said, I'm all liken him to a man that built his house upon the sand. And when the winds and the waves came, great was the fall of that house. Why? Because it was built on sand. It wasn't built on something that was stable. But Jesus went on and said, uh, Blessed is the man that heareth my words and doeth them, or put them to effect, incorporate them in our life, and doeth them. I liken him to a man that built his house on the rock. And when the winds came and the rains came, that house stood. That shows you the difference between a hearer and a hear one that hears and does. So there's two different things that happen there and two houses. And so which one do you want to be? Do you want to be the one that collapses and falls? If not, then you got to be not only a hearer, but a doer. And let's go ahead into the third chapter, and we'll we'll start with that. Uh, and this is James three and one. 
says, my brethren, be not masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Uh, be not many masters. Uh, and again, this is a point that we we make uh, if we feel like we're masters over our our fellow brothers and sisters. We want to make them our servants. And then we've got the wrong attitude. That's not what we're should, we are to do. Jesus said, he that is greatest among you, let him be the servant of all. And so let's read that again. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. And if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. My goodness, let's read that again. It's worthy of, of hearing that again. Uh, for in many things we offend all, and how? With our tongue. And if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, wheresoever or whithersoever the governor listed. Why is he saying all this? That a ship can be turned about by just a little helm? Or uh, that a little bit, you know how large a horse is, and just a bit in his mouth can, can turn him? Well, we're going to find out. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and it boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Wow. And the sixth verse, and the tongue is a fire, and a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. It is set on fire of hell. And let's keep reading here. The seventh verse. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue no man can tame. It is unruly, evil, and full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessings and cursings, my brethren, these things ought not to be. And he goes on to say, Do a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt and fresh. Now, those are words that we ought to pay attention to. It says our tongue can set on fire the courses of hell and, and how it can defile the whole body. And uh, it's a world of iniquity. Oh, he's really laying it hard on the tongue. And this is a point I want to make to you also. He said, no man can tame the tongue. 
want you to pay particular attention to that portion of that verse. No man can tame the tongue. Well, then we don't have no hope then, do we? If it's a world of iniquity and it's going to cause us problems and we can't get over the hump, then what hope is there for us? Here's the point I want to bring out in particular with this. It says, no man can tame the tongue. But you know, when you seek God, when you go to God, God can tame your tongue. And what I mean by that is when you seek the Holy Ghost, God chose this method of speaking in tongues to show that he is able to control the tongue and that if we put our life in his and we obey what he tells us and we use that Holy Ghost that he gave us, we can, we can control the tongue. We can contain, contain the tongue. And see, with, with this thought, we need to remember that, that uh, uh, it says uh, uh, the heart or the, the heart or the mind is a, uh, a great thing. And as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. But you know, with the mouth, we speak things. And this is a good point for us because if we are all the time speaking negative, then what kind of man will we be? A negative man. Because your mouth is telling what your mind's thinking. But if your, your thoughts are wholesome and your thoughts are, are good and those type things, then what kind of man can you be? but one that's positive and one that is looking toward God. And, and let me read a, uh, another scripture to go with this thought. Uh, let's turn to Philippians. That's in the fourth chapter. And this is what it says. Uh, I'm going to start at the sixth verse of the fourth chapter. And it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, thing by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. How? How is that happening? Let's read it again. The peace of God with passes all understanding shall keep your heart and mind through Jesus Christ or through the power that Jesus Christ can plant in our life and through his words. And he goes on to say, finally, brethren, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. That tells us how our mind should be, and when our mind is working, it should tell how, through the tongue, what we're saying is what we're thinking and what we're living. And uh, as I said once before, going back to the book of Matthew, when Jesus made the statement, uh, he's told us not to, to uh, put up treasures here on the earth, 
but he told us to uh, put treasures in heaven. And he says, for where your heart is, or where your treasures are, there is your heart also. And so by knowing, you can be around a person and you can know what they treasure in their life by the words that they speak, by the life that they live. So we'll pick this up again uh, next week uh, and we'll, we'll go on through the book of James. I hope you've enjoyed this. Amen.